Hello, everyone. I'm Raina Heaton from the University of Oklahoma, speaking on behalf of myself and my colleagues, William O'Grady and Sharon Nastioka from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and Jeanette King from the University of Canterbury. Um, today, I'd like to talk about work we've been doing for several years now, uh, looking at how to gauge progress in language revitalization programs with the aim of improving language learning outcomes for students. Uh, we've collaborated with several indigenous language programs, and we're excited to give you some preliminary results from that, um, particularly as it relates to vocabulary development. So while there's a lot of helpful research out there on language acquisition, particularly for majority languages, there's very little on the language revitalization context specifically. So part of what we're doing is hoping to address that gap in our knowledge and to look specifically at school-based immersion programs, which in a lot of ways are sort of the gold standard and exist in a lot of communities. Um, and we're particularly interested in them because uh, in a lot of cases, the, the language that children are hearing from their teachers is most of what they're getting total. You know, in some cases, you're lucky enough to have language at home, but in other cases, you know, that's a significant portion of the child's day. And so what children will be exposed to from their teachers is very important to look at. So our goals um, are to understand the nature of the input. So what children are hearing in immersion programs with the goals of ensuring that that input provides enough exposure to the language for children to become proficient speakers. And then seek ways which we might uh, look at pedagogy and teacher talk um, to improve children's prospects for acquiring language efficiently. So here, like I said, we're focusing on vocabulary um, for which we are considering two different common cross-linguistic measures. So first being quantity, which is the amount of speech to which children are exposed as measured by the average number of words that children hear in some unit of time, an hour, a day, a year. And then quality, which is the number of different words that children are hearing in that same time frame, which is essentially a measure of lexical diversity. So uh, our methodology is actually um, fairly simple, although it's been a long process and we've been working with these programs for several years now. Um, we collaborate with teachers and administrators in three school-based immersion programs, which I'll tell you about in a second, um, to do some just naturalistic recording of what they're doing in the classroom. So um, first, uh, teachers recorded themselves in class um, for one to two weeks. Uh, once the recordings were made, they were transcribed and tagged by fluent speakers of the three languages. And uh, then we looked at some common vocabulary metrics for each program, so a little bit of analysis, and then shared the results back with the program administrators and the teachers. Um, the three programs uh, were chosen partly because they represent different types of revitalization situations. So partial immersion, full immersion, and language maintenance. Um, and I will introduce each of them to you without further ado. So um, first up is Kakachika, which is a Maya language of Guatemala. Um, it has about 400,000 native speakers still, uh, mostly in the rural areas. The school we were working with is a, was, at the time of recording, a partial immersion school, meaning that lots of courses, namely math, art, computers, phys ed, and Kakshikel language um, were taught in Kakshikel uh, for a total of two to three hours a day. The rest of the day was in Spanish. Uh, students were first through fourth graders, um, and they're all ethnically Kakshikel, although not all of them uh, although their home language in this particular area is Spanish. And um, we recorded the math teacher. Next program is Maori, uh, which of course is well known for their excellent language revitalization programs. Um, it's a Polynesian language of New Zealand. Um, the school programs are full immersion. So all subjects are taught in Maori except for English. Um, the students were nine to 10 years old. So a little bit older than the Kakshikel students. Uh, about half received semi-regular exposure to Maori in the home or in their community. And then a lot of these children had been in immersion for a long time. So they started at the age of about five. And we recorded uh, one teacher who is uh, a highly proficient L2 speaker. Uh, finally, Western Subanon is a language of the Philippines, uh, which 
by endangerment metrics is endangered, but in the particular community where we were recording, it's still spoken actively by children. So um, all the teachers at the school were native speakers of Western Savannah and their parents speak to them in that language. So the program at school perhaps is more rightly called a language maintenance program. So all instruction is in Western Savannah and the kids when they get to school already come in knowing how to speak the language. Um, we recorded first and second grade classes and there was one teacher for first grade, one teacher for second grade that we recorded. So a total of two teachers. So uh, preliminary metrics in terms of vocabulary. So the, the most basic thing to look at is of course, how much time was spent actually speaking the language during the school day as a way to get sort of a base off which we can compare other things. So this was measured in hours and minutes of in-class uh, recording time. Uh, a caveat, of course, that, you know, said like for Kakshikal that there, there was um, Kakshikal medium instruction for two to three hours a day. Well, of course, that includes like student work time and breaks and pauses and times the teacher is not speaking, right? So this is actually a metric of all of the only exact times that speech was actually happening, excluding pauses and things like that. So it's a little bit more specific. So here we go with the uh, school day contact time uh, for each of the programs, the total time that they spent speaking out of that time, and then the percentage that that represents. So between 13% of the immersion time to 25% of the immersion time, roughly, which may seem a little bit low, but actually these are this is quite in line with um, first language naturalistic speech. So usually time to talk ratios for naturalistic situations are like 10% to 30%. So we're, we're right on target here um, on par with non-school settings. Uh, a related metric, you know, now that we know how much time was spent speaking the language, we can look at how many words the children are hearing, which is vocabulary, which is the point of the thing. So first, um, we measured, measured the total number of words spoken by the teacher in the recording time frame, uh, and then the number of words per hour of speech produced by the teacher for comparability reasons. So here we go, total number of words produced by each teacher, which ranged from 21 to 88,000 words. Um, of course, this doesn't account for differences in how internally complex a word is. So for example, Kakshika words are internally quite complex, um, but it is sort of a, a word is a, a relevant cross-linguistic metric. Um, and as an extension of this, I think we need to look at this in terms of number of words per hour for our school contact time. So here we go, the contact time from before, and then the words per hour of contact time. So it's about a thousand or you know, 1700 at the high end um, for words per contact hour. Um, for the sake of context, let's just compare this with a monolingual setting. So these are all figures for English um, from different studies. And you can see it ranges from you know, 2000 something to 600 something down here. So Western Sabanan and Maori both fall pretty solidly in the middle of these figures. And then Kakhtika is a little bit on the low end, but again, Kakhtika words are very complex. Um, but the, the takeaway here is that all these numbers um, fall within like basically monolingual recorded ranges, which is really great. Okay, to switch gears a little bit, um, these last metrics have been quantity metrics. So in terms of number of words, uh, let's talk about quality. So when you talk about quality, really you're talking about types, uh, which are the number of different words per hour of speech produced by the teacher, um, as opposed to tokens, which is just, you know, how many words total as opposed to just different words. So let's look at the token to type ratio. So here we go, here's our token figures for a total number of words and then types, so unique words here, and then the ratio of those two things. So the ratios span from like 12 to one to 26 to one, which Maori is a little high here, probably because of its typology that's got a lot of particles and um, things like that. Uh, if we compare it again to English um, for a corpus of roughly the same size, 
uh, you see that our token to type ratios here are a little bit higher, um, but not terribly so, which generally means just a little bit less lexical diversity, um, which could be due to any number of things, including just the school context in general. So if you remember for Kakshipel, we're talking about math class. So you've got sort of a little bit of topical constraints also. Uh, Right alongside uh, with this is the idea of frequency or how often each different word is said. So we're looking at sort of the distributional skew, if you will, of words in the teacher's speech, as well as how many words are making up like the bulk of what children are hearing and then what words are really very frequent. Um, to preface this, I need to mention something that's true of all languages. So um, Ziff's law or Ziff's the zip curve here um, basically shows that words used in natural speech are heavily skewed with respect to their frequency. So very a few words are highly frequent and then the rest um, are very infrequent. So basically what I just said, most words occur rarely uh, with most occurring only once, even in large samples of texts, which looks like a long tail on, on the curve. So, of course, this affects the opportunities learners have to learn most words in a language, you know, if most of them are in the tail. And this isn't something that, you know, only pertains to certain languages. This is a fact of all languages, and we expect to see this reflected in our programs as well. So, in fact, we do, as you can see here. Um, you've got a very zipped and looking curve. This is just the 100 most frequent words in every language. Um, are spoken by every teacher. And then what percent that is of the total tokens. So you can see that just a few words are super, super frequent. And then right around 20 here, you see a change where every word is only 1% or fewer of the, the input. But they're less and less likely, less and less common. Said another way, um, you can look at this chart for comparison. Um, You've got the 25 most frequent words and the percent of the corpus it makes up and the percent that represents of different words, 50 most frequent words, 100 most frequent words, just as a baseline. So if you look down here for English, 50% uh, of a 20,000 word corpus only contains 1% of the different words in that same corpus, right? Um, and we see that more or less reflected also in these programs where 50 to 60% of the corpus consists only of the 50 most frequent words. So um, quick summary, um, as I said, those 50 words represent only between one to 4% of unique words in each corpus. Uh, said another way, approximately half of what our teachers said to their students in the sample period consisted of the same 25 to 50 words, and that's inflected and in everything. Those are like um, identical words. Um, and moreover, 40 to 60% of all unique words in our corpora appear fewer than three times, which you can see here in this chart. So the um, number of words is less than or equal to two, and it's quite a lot of different words, um, making up about half of total, total um, lexical diversity. Okay, so how to apply this usefully. Um, first, just to summarize, um, our immersion programs are more or less quite good in terms of reflecting a monolingual setting. So it has several things in common with our English monolingual data. Um, low overall time to talk ratios uh, per hour word total ranging from 900 to 1700. Um, token type ratios that are more or less on par for 20,000 word corpora, um, and the expected Ziffian effect, where the 50 most frequent lexical items make up about half of all the words that were encountered in teacher's speech. So that's, that's pretty great. Uh, however, there are still some things to think about. So even if a child in an immersion program and a child in a home setting hear approximately the same number of words per hour, so right or about 1,000 metric, there's still a huge difference based on how many hours of exposure they're getting, right? So for example, the Kakshi Pale children in this, at the time of recording, were getting about two to three hours a day 
Whereas in a sort of a home language setting, you'd be getting a lot more, you'd be like 12 to 14 hours a day, which is a really big difference, particularly cumulatively over a long period of time. Um, so, and even if you have a full immersion program, um, that's, you know, 25% of a child's day, right? Um, and then what about the rest of the day? And then of course there's this law, um, which affects language acquisition because most of the words that children need to learn, the long tail, right, are really infrequent, um, which has some practical implications uh, to again, sort of use English as a benchmark. Uh, English children by the age of about six uh, have about six to 10,000 word vocabularies. And we know from other experimental evidence that um, it takes a debatable number, but you know, perhaps as many as a dozen exposures to a new word to successfully acquire it fully. Um, and that's a lot. So it's a little unfair because we only recorded for one to two weeks, but um, in the span of about 20,000 words, um, only 250 to 300 words from our programs had 12 or more exposures over that period of time. And of course, this, it only gets harder, right, to get bigger vocabularies because more and more of what you need to know is in that really infrequent long part of the tail rather than perhaps the little bulkier part of the tail where it's easier to get more reps. Um, so it's something to think about definitely as you think about um, exposing children to a variety of lexical items. So basically we'd like to encourage immersion programs uh, to design their curricula to overcome these two challenges. Um, basically this Ziffian distribution of words and frequency um, and limited exposure sort of generally because of the school-based context. Um, so what are some things to do? Basically, we have a deliberate effort to flatten the curve, which I realize now means something else, but basically just ensure exposure to lower frequency words sort of on purpose in a way that you wouldn't have to if you could give like long periods of exposure. Um, increase the amount of input to children, which can be even little things like just talking more. So for Western Subodern, we had two teachers, one of which was more talkative than the other. And cumulatively, cumulatively over the course of a year, that's gonna make a really big difference in terms of the total amount of language that the children hear. And then finally, I hope that um, these types of metrics um, can be used for program assessment and that you know, people will find them helpful. It's really basic stuff and takes what's already present in the classroom um, sort of in a low stress way. Hopefully that, that can be helpful to people. Um, so some parting thoughts. Uh, in the case of first language acquisition, of course, uh, it can things can be a little more haphazard because there's enough time involved that children will learn their language sort of no matter what to a satisfactory level of proficiency. Um, however, in uh, language revitalization settings, it's harder to leave these things to chance. You know, the stakes are much greater. Um, that's why it's important to engage in rigorous programs of training and curriculum planning and proficiency assessment, which I know everybody knows. But the, the application of this to vocabulary in particular and using it to encourage vocabulary growth in a measured way, I think is an exciting opportunity to put sort of policy into practice. So with that, I will say thank you to our teachers and our program administrators, transcribers, data compilers, everybody who helped us along the way, and to all of you for your time and attention. Mahalo.